Hi. Uh, gonna do my acoustic set. Hope you all are ready. <laughs> um, so I want to start off. Uh, I got no cards, so deal with it. I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, I want to start off with uh, something I, I, I thought of initially when I spoke with Mario and, and, and Kara. It's like we're talking truth. You thought you weren't going to see me? I'm no Cyrus of this shit. To echo ODB, <laughs> so we tank forever. Uh, a little triumph there for you. And um, I, I want to start off this sort of interaction we're all going to have with uh, the truth. Um, I never really know how I'm going to start these things, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a talk, but eventually, eventually I'll find my way. So my podcast, my professional and personal identities, truth has always been at the forefront. I always talk to people and say the only thing I really owe anybody is the truth. Um, and before I get too deep into that piece of it, um, I got to unburden myself. I got to share the truth. Um, it's just with a heavy heart, I get on the stage and got to share with you all that. Um, forgive me when I say this. It's so cringy, so embarrassing. I give myself my own nicknames. I, I know it's a thing you're not supposed to do. So I'm going to share a few with you because why wouldn't I? The first one, Rob with the hard R. I, I like that one a little too much. It's, it gives provocative. It gives risky. <laughs> um, young fish. Uh, I, I, that, that comes off fishy, right? But I was told I have a Lawrence Fishburne energy, a, a little you know, more furious styles and dash of Morpheus in there. So I think it's apt. And lastly, um, and you know, as an Aquarius, this is just close to my heart. Um, and I have a, have a, a visual aid. Um, I'm an Aquarius, and I'm told I have daddy energy. So as I'll put these cards down for a moment, uh, wave daddy is the other one. And uh, yeah, that is the one. Uh, I'll be playing right field next season. Um, so uh, yeah, look out for that. Um, so thank you for allowing me to really bear my soul and just get this, this weight off of these manly and massive shoulders of mine. <sighs> Great. Uh, so, you know, as I was talking earlier, uh, professional, creative, all of that good stuff, by day, I'm a data analyst. Um, a lot of my work has to do with getting deep, getting granular, looking at what is the root cause of a particular thing. Um, I'm in higher ed, so I'm doing data for that particular cause. And for the last 15 years, I've been in that field. I've been from data specialist to data analyst to senior data analyst. So unlike a lot of people, because I see a lot of applications, I know how to use Excel. I know how to do a pivot table. <laughs> uh, a lot of people lie. A lot of people lie. And, <laughs> and, and almost for that same amount of time, I've, I've been a podcaster and storyteller. So I'm living kind of two identities with truth and storytelling and data being at the forefront. Um, and storytelling is integral to sharing the truth. And the stories that I tell and I help try to bring the light and the truth in this art, you know, they have to do with people, culture, art, community. So preparing for this talk, I wanted to examine parts, because I was looking back, I wanted to examine parts of my creative and professional journey. You know, 37, so 15 years is a nice chunk of time for me. And it even goes back longer, because. You know, I had to do, I, I did a um, degree in like data analysis. So really that's been a part of me for a very long time and getting into the weeds. And even with other podcasts that I do, I do a movie review podcast and I get really in the weeds. Like, why did they make that movie? Why did they do it that way? Why did they hire this person? Um, and I think I, as I go through this sort of career, creative thing, I want to... Uh, give you guys like a key key takeaway. I'm gonna do the thing that I think all good professors and teachers do. I'm not a, not a professor, obviously, um, but they give you the answers before the test and see if you actually were listening. So this is this is what we're gonna do. This is what we're gonna do. So so here's the key takeaway that I want you to well take away. That, that's what I wrote. I wrote that down. That sounds super corny. Uh, <laughs> so get your pencils ready or your devices. You get you guys are you guys have devices. Um, your truth isn't the only truth. Lean in and seek to understand. Um, go deep 
and then do that again and do that again. So I'm not a lecturer, even though it sounds a little lectury, uh, and I'm not going to lecture to you, but I want to share you know, some of those, those, these quotes that I have and a story that relates to each one of these quotes. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to start off with, uh, I think I have a visual aid for it. My first quote, it's a um, Maya Angelou quote. You don't have to tell everything you know, but let what you do say be the truth as you understand it. So, you know, Baltimore native, black Baltimore native. Uh, and I finish a lot of my food ordering with salt, pepper, ketchup. Some of y'all get that. Some of y'all get that. So I appreciate it. Shout out to y'all. Um, <laughs> it's just a string. You know, you just, just look it up. It's fine. Um, and for the better part of my adult life, I've been brought into like conversations and being that sort of Baltimore representative, you know, and I'm sure many of you have heard it. The, is Baltimore like the wire? Is Baltimore this? Is it really dangerous? The whole thing, the song and dance, it's fine. Um, and I would get this a lot in like Baltimore places or places that are around that if a person actually had some interest, they can come and check out and see all of the great arts, culture, and people that are in a place. So. You know, back at Morgan, I would hear these different questions, and you know, I'm I'm definitely up for the conversation. Yeah, I'll tell you about Baltimore. This is what I see, and it doesn't really fit what they they've been told. Uh, I remember, um, I, re I remember a guy from D.C. I was in a, uh, I think it was a, it was a real estate course, and I was like, yeah, I lived here, here, and here. And this guy from D.C. He's like, you lived in all the d drug spots. It's like, thank you. That, that, that was my home, you know. <laughs> And um, as I think about it, I would get more defensive, but also kind of acknowledging there's some degree of truth to it. Like, you know, Baltimore's not the wire. It's wire-ish. It's wire light. Low-carb wire. Um, keto for you, you know, people. <laughs> so for years in being in this sort of uh, pro-Baltimore posture, this defensive posture, I um, would even tell people, like, don't, doesn't your city have similar issues? Don't you have some of these kind of same things, these things that have blighted our reputation and so on here? So, and I think this is one of my favorite parts of this. So back in 2019, an apricot-colored asshole uh, had my beloved Baltimore in his crosshairs, and he took some shots. He, you know, talked really ill about you know, various communities, various cities, and Baltimore was deemed just a city filled with rats. And every, every city has rats. Uh, so I found that this, this person's narrative um, in a very public space was incorrect, incomplete, and it was racially coded, racially energized. So I felt the best way, instead of getting high, the high blood pressure and, God damn this person, I can't believe you say that shit like that, I thought, it would make more sense to try to disprove it. So I started reaching out to people. I remember um, I reached out to James Nasty. Uh, that was the first interview I did. Um, then I reached out to Easy Jackson. Started just reaching out to different people to get a temperature on what is true for you? What is Baltimore for you? Will you be a part of this journey? Um, and you know, early on, I, I remember uh, <laughs> one of the, the first things um, that Easy Jackson said on the interview He's like, fuck that orange bitch. That was the first thing that he said. And I was like, oh, we're, we're starting off strong. This is, this is great. And really, I felt that there was a lot of value in there, having people who often don't get the opportunity to share their stories, you know, as they see it from their perspective. It's like really community building, really sharing, sharing the truth. So at this juncture, we're coming up on, and since July of 2019, I'm nearing 500 um, episodes of The Truth in His Art. So, thank you. <laughs> and um, many of you, April, <laughs> many of you have been on there, so thank you for, for sharing and being a part of Zoe, shout out to you. Thank you all for being a part of it and, and being on there and adding to this sort of like continuing narrative of what Baltimore truly is. In a sense, we're speaking for ourselves. Um, so, <laughs> where am I at? Yeah, so, Got that, got that, move that out of there. Oh, and yeah, this, this other sense of, again, going with this kind of continual narrative of people just felt cool with spreading disinformation and misinformation. We were in this sort of age of, of sharing that, and I think 
it, it impacted people. I think people were fine with having someone talk shit about your city, talk shit about the people that you live around, the people that, you know, real people. And it's, it's politicized, it's all of these different things. So I think being able to have a counter narrative from people that are actually living it, the boots on the ground, if you will, that's something that's very important to, you know, have in there as a counter narrative. So the second quote that I have, Uh, no one is more hated than he who speaks the truth. So obviously I feel, I feel the hate on occasion. Uh, it goes down in the DMs, as they say. Uh, <laughs> a lot of key, keyboard tough guys. Um, so I, I aspire to be as truthful as I can be at a moment. Like I, I only know what I know. When I get new information, update. It's, this, it's the same thing you do with like data. You find something that disproves a, a certain report or a case, and like, all right, we need to look at this. We need to tweak the SQL script or what have you. And back in 2018, uh, I was working as a data analyst. Again, you know, these parallels. And I was at a Catholic institution. It's like, this is going to be wonderful. My mom worked here. You know, the, the prodigal son is returning? I don't know. But I was, I was able to go there. My mom used to work. That was her first job. So I felt really juiced up and wanted to go there. And um, a few months after I started, you make some observations. You see a place. And um, there was this email, uh, the, like the black distro. I was like, weird title, but whatever. Uh, and there was this call to bring on more people reflective of the communities that we were serving. So on the walls in this place, you'd see um, you know, different countries represented. You'd see you know, countries within Africa. You'd see uh, countries in the Caribbean. It's a lot of brown, brown black people there. And the staff was very white. So that, that counter is there, and they wanted to kind of bring in more people that were reflective. So, you know, in essence, uh, <laughs> this place kind of had this sort of like white saviorish vibe. And ultimately, we brought together a listening tour. And the demographics were such that I think I was the only black guy in this meeting, uh, and I was the only like black guy doing data and in leadership. So it's just, we needed to bring in more, more of uh, more diversity, I suppose. So, you know, we're attending, we're we're brought in, we do this whole thing, we do this meeting, and um, I had this coworker who I would send reports to, and I don't know why she did not like my data, she did not like my reports, and I was like, my reports are great, they're wonderful, they have the right colors, they're blue and green sometimes, they're great. I'm being art, you know, artistic, and creative, everyone's creative, and. Um, <laughs> so I, I remember she would very publicly, like via email, but publicly kind of, I think this is an issue here, Rob, and CC the entire staff. And then later when she realizes, oh, I misinterpreted the report, I'm sorry, privately, after hours, you know, that vibe, the CC vibe. Um, so she was at this meeting as well as I, and I was like, all right, I don't care about her. I don't care about her story at all. That was kind of my energy, and after she started um, expressing in this meeting about diversity and all, what what her story was as a, a queer woman in this environment and some of the things that she experienced that weren't great, I was like, all right, let me get past my ego, and let me actually listen in and try to empathize and, and understand this person and have this sort of common ground. I was like, almost forgiven in, in my mind. I was like, I want to talk with her, and let's break bread, and you know, I'll just use a black and white report later. I, I don't know. <laughs> so I listened and empathized. And um, so, you know, at a point at the meeting, you know, you have a six foot four, 300 pound black man there. It's like, hey, you in the corner eating the donuts and the, the, you know, the coffee, you got anything to say? So I was called on, you know, it's called on me. And um, I don't really like doing that because I can kind of get a little too real and the truth can be ugly and it's not always what people want to hear. So, you know, I spoke up. I spoke up what my experience was, and I'd been there a few months, and I always preface it in a very sort of diplomatic way. I don't know everything. However, this is what I experienced. And um, I was talking about if you want to bring in more people that are reflective, you got to start paying talent. you got to be equitable. you got to start doing things that make sense. Um, and you have to be involved in the community. And I was you know, identifying certain things that I saw culturally. Uh, it's like... These walls are weird, guys. You gotta do something about these walls. A lot of black kids in there, I don't know about these walls. And um, as I'm kind of going in, into it, and um, again, trying to be as diplomatic as possible, next to me, 
there, there are two white women who are in a different department. I've never met them. And they're in this meeting and they're cutting me off at every moment. You guys always talk about race. I was like, oh, this, this is what we're doing. And they're just still going. And they're rephrasing everything that I was describing. <laughs> it's like in live and color, they paraphrase my whole spiel. And then the meeting wraps. I'm like, wow. I, I felt this sort of microaggression, this, this sort of hate, this, this look that I saw in their faces that wasn't there when we entered this meeting that we're being asked to, why don't we have black and brown people? A black and brown person is saying, maybe this is a reason. So at a point, maybe two, three weeks later, I was like, I'm not gonna stay here. I gotta get out of here. Doesn't work, doesn't fit. Um, this whole notion of suppressing the truth or just not having that as a priority. It's like, I'm out. So apply for a job, which I'm currently at. Uh, and I wrote my letter of resignation. And I, I go there, and my boss started ducking me. She just wasn't in the office. And I believe you do the professional thing. You don't just leave. You, you give them the letter of resignation in an envelope, you know, with a little stamp on there, like it's a seal from, you know, Westeros or something. <laughs> and <laughs> so I planned on doing that. And we had a meeting scheduled, like, so on a Wednesday. Coming there on a Tuesday, all of my access was gone. And I was like, this is fishy. And I come in there um, on that Wednesday. My access was restored on that, that Tuesday prior. Coming in on Wednesday. And um, we have a side meeting for a performance review. I was like, oh, for me? And uh, I'm planning on handing my letter of resignation. It's gonna be a nice handoff. And we go into this side room, right? I don't know if any of you seen Goodfellas. I felt like Joe Pesci. I was like, oh no, I, I got whacked. I got professionally whacked. So, you know, I, I leave out and um, I get the perp walk out, which was very weird optically, but eh, whatever. And, um, I didn't really look back. I, I kind of scoffed at it more than anything else. And, but I kept that in my pocket, this sort of idea that, you know, you're sharing the truth. It's not the thing that people want to hear. They want, they have a narrative in their mind of, this is what your experience is. I was like, not quite. And I felt like I got the reprimand or I felt like I took an L for um, speaking the truth from, from my experience. Yeah, so watch out for those, uh, those meetings with safe space and uh, real talk are said. Uh, here's, here's the last one I got for you. Uh, the only passion that guides me is for the truth. I look at everything from that point of view, Che Guevara. So I get asked a lot, um, how do you do so much? Like for context, and then I have a day job, have the full-time day job, and then I do a podcast schedule that at times can lead to me recording 18 interviews in a week. So people are like, yo, you're putting out stuff every day. And I was like, I am, because uh, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with it. Uh, and I want the truth, damn it. And, <laughs> and, I, and, I'm, and I'm going after, and I think being able to learn from people and learn what their stories are, it's a lot of interest there. And even when, you know, I said, I dive in. I get into the weeds, and I look back at even some of the day job stuff. Um, I was learning SQL because no one truly uses Excel. We use SQL. Uh, I was using learning SQL, and you know we're coming up around like Giving Tuesday, and I was in a position where I needed to quickly like learn something and dive really into it. So I'm using SQL to do like this huge data set for Giving Tuesday. Um, I'd never done it before. I was there for like two years in this role, um, in this development role. And this was the second Given Tuesday. The first one, I had some support. We brought in like $2 million. Yay us. The second one time, I was like, I'm doing this by myself. We're fucked. And <laughs> so I had to quickly learn it. And I was staying in like long hours. And then I got really, really, really interested. And I was like, this is like a puzzle. This is like problem solving. This really appeals to me. I love this. And um, we were able to, during that Giving Tuesday, based on the data that I was providing and the segmentation and all, we brought in $2.9 million on a Giving Tuesday. So it's like really dope. So it's like that, you know, just obsessions when it comes to getting granular, looking at the root cause, whether it's in my sort of data work, you know, being there for a very long time now that I think about it. <laughs> and um, and in my, my podcasting work, you know, I'm focusing most of the work in Baltimore, obviously, but you know, I've been able to even extend into other cities. Uh, it's a series of interviews called 
the truth in his heart beyond. And I went to um, Austin, Texas, and really driven by, there's something in the background here, I'm not quite sure what it is, and it ended up kind of you know, having a conversation I didn't intend to have based on this sort of going deep, that they were talking about the shrinking um, uh, black population there. I didn't know that was a thing. I thought it was, hey, keep Austin weird. And I was like, no, keep Austin non-black because people are moving out. Didn't know that. And I think this pursuit and diving in, you end up finding things that uh, open up for more conversation and more learning and I can uh, continue this obsession. So um, that's, that's it for me? Uh, guess you got questions? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, we are ready for questions now. Who has a question for Rob? Oh, I see one over here. Thank you. Oh, I also want to say thank you to Creative Mornings for a mic. I really believe in mics. Um, I have a question for you as far as organizing time. So if you're saying you're recording 18, what's your process as far as editing, you know, making sure your, your interviewees are prepared, con connecting with them? Like, how are you staying organized in that way? Um, thank you. Um, I am a big advocate of stacking time uh, and looking at, like, peak hours. So on a Monday, let's say I'll look at what I have coming up in terms of how many interviews do I have in a given week. And I spend two, depending on the, the number of interviews, but I spend a couple hours per person looking at old interviews to come up with questions because I want to have something that is interesting. I want to have something that gets that, you know, I've never heard that one before. It's like, yeah, I know you haven't because I did that shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I, I try to stack that time and I, as far as editing, I have an editor um, that I work with. I'm capable of doing it myself, but it's, it's just no way. And um, in addition, uh, I believe that scheduling emails, as far as like, you know, having that follow up schedule, are we good? So for the last two and a half months, I've been going up there to Philly um, every two weeks. And yesterday was a little bit of an aberration. Uh, two people canceled the last minute. So I was like, oh, so you're not gonna be in this interview that we had scheduled two weeks ago. <laughs> So it's just kind of checking in and getting that sort of feedback to make sure that I have everything scheduled, everything in place, and you know, really kind of polishing how I go about it. Some of the earlier interviews, they were maybe an hour, some were even like an hour and a half, and I'm like, I don't know if I have enough, I don't know if they have enough. Now it's usually in that sweet spot of about 37 minutes, and it's kind of like what we get is what we get, and my job is to help facilitate what they want to discuss when it comes to their work and how they approach authentically presenting themselves. Hope that helps. <laughs> Who else has a question? I can ask a question. Uh, so tell us about like how did the podcast thing start? Did you do like college radio or like how did how did you even get into this? So it goes way back to City College. Shout out Zoe. Uh, it goes way back to City College. Uh, so this is 1999 when I had like one of those little you click and you ask people really goofy questions. And because I was wildly immature at the time, I would ask the questions in the third person because I was obsessed with The Rock. So it's like The Rob says, uh, and you know, that was kind of my, <laughs> that's so nickname. embarrassing, I'm just sharing my life. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I got into it then and I really liked it and I started to become a, I was rapping at the time as well. I started to become a, uh, a radio nerd and listening to a lot of talk radio, usually like out of market, DC, California. And I was like, there's something here. So back in 2009, when I started formally podcasting, I got really into some of the weird news stories and the current events. And I was like, I think I have something to say about this. So I went to Best Buy, got like a Fast Track Pro, a couple mics and um, I think some headphones and I just started recording. And it was an excuse at the beginning for me to um, kind of connect and maintain these relationships with my friends. And uh, over that sort of 10 years, seeing different things. Um, so 2015, or maybe 16, 2015, when the news reporting around Freddie Gray went out, I was doing a podcast when I got the alert on my phone. And I was like, wow, and I wrote that into a script. I was like, there's something here, this sort of timing. And I just remember my co-host and I, we were kind of talking about more serious matters. And I was like, how do we change how Baltimore is presented? 
so I was part of a podcast network at the time. And as you remember, one of the people that was kind of um, helping to fund this network, uh, and I was doing like a side project with them. So just, you know, kind of helping them out. They'd never been to Baltimore. They made this point. Like, you guys are Baltimoreans. Oh, you guys must be thugs. I was like, it's me and a, a goofy white dude. What are, you, what are you saying? What are we, thugs? And um, I just remember some of the, she was, she was very pro apricot if you will. And uh, she was like, yes, yeah, so, you know, with some of the responses, she was saying, there's a lot of baby mama drama in Baltimore. They need to do something about these kids. And I was like, you're saying a bunch of bullshit. And I called her on it. And ultimately, I was like, there's something here. There's something here as far as just, being able to speak authentically about what you're seeing and the realness that's there. You know, people taking shots when we were in this sort of weird space racially and with police and just police related violence. And, you know, once I got to 2019 and the Trump <laughs> stuff happened, uh, I wanted to do something like this. I wanted to do something that I felt compelled to do and I felt it in my soul. So it's kind of this sort of 14, almost 14 year trajectory, it'll be 14 years in February, uh, trajectory of me uh, being a non-podcaster to podcaster to doing this podcast. Hello. Howdy. Uh, two questions. One, who is a truth teller that inspires you? And then the other part to that is, is there uh, a dream list of folks to interview? for this upcoming season? That's a great question. So you, you did it, you did the thing I do. Uh, so initially when I came up with the quotes, I had a quote from Malcolm X. That's, that's kind of in that lane, the Malcolm X, the Muhammad Ali types. Uh, it, just, it just clicks for me. And I, I think it just resonates in such a way. I don't want to sound like LeBron and start capping up here. Of, yeah. Um, but I think it's, I think those are the people I look at as like sort of the truth tellers that are there. A, a, a little Richard Pryor in there as well. Um, I dig that. Um, as far as dream interviews, I might have a few already scheduled, but um, I, I would I would love to talk with uh, Donald Glover, um, like outside, because I've been able and been afforded the opportunity to do some interviews outside of the Baltimore market. Um, yesterday I met W. Kamal Bell, so that may be an interview that's coming soon. Um, and as far as locally, John Wards is definitely on the list. Um, just, you know, you gotta, you gotta key in on it. Um, I, I want to get Derek Adams. Um, that's also, he's also on the list. And there, there's a few um, others, but those, those are the two names that really pop. Amy Sherold as well probably, um, with those sort of Baltimore ties. Um, but those are the names that pop right now. Um, I have a question. So I'm an international student, and before coming here, I was kind of uh, expecting to face certain, you know, racist thing, racist, racist comments. But what I did not expect was microaggressions, which I didn't, I didn't really know about as much. So um, it's, um, I just want to ask, how do you navigate that sometimes? Because sometimes I'm like, oh, maybe I'm thinking too much, and maybe it's like a couple of people, they're not including me in a conversation. That's because of maybe something about me or me not knowing anything. But sometimes it's, it, is an, it is a microaggression that, you know, even the topics that I know about, I would not be included in those. So how do you navigate um, around those things when there's like things that you know about, things that you're interested in, you would like to join a conversation, but you know, just how do you navigate around those? Sure, thank you. Um, it's, it's a challenge at times. Uh, I, I have this, um, one, of the, one of the things I'm very, <laughs> I gotta admit, uh, very fearful and very, uh, it's a trigger, I, I'll say. Um, so at one job, uh, I got a performance review that had these sort of things in there that kind of echoed this sentiment, I'm a scary black man. And it bugged me. <laughs> and the, the irony of it, it was this book about microaggressions that was going around the office. Everyone read this, it's important. And I was like, hmm. But my actual performance review had it written in there. And 
I've never gotten anything like that before. And I was like, I can't change who I am. In fact, I try to co combat it. Like, I recognize that I'm 6'4", I'm taller than your average person or what have you. So I'm sitting down to do meetings. It's like, oh, yeah, let me just, uh, you got the power dynamic. And at a point, I was just like, no, nah, I'm not really going to do this. This is not true for me. This is, I'm going to feel how I feel about it. Um, but I'm going to just look for evidence contrary to it and, you know, just kind of reach for those opportunities to be more me, more out there, and give them something to be mad about. That's really the only thing that I've been able to do, um, you know, in this sort of podcast and this sort of journey and being more out there. Six months ago, me being in front of y'all people would not happen. Um, but doing it now, it's like really comfortable. I consider you guys my friends. Uh, and you know, as I was touching on earlier with some of the stuff in the, the DMs, some of the weird comments I've gotten uh, in the DMs, I'm Republic. I've been described as militant. I've been described in email as disingenuous, all of these, these different things. But then having like evidence contrary, again, being a data guy, you're so authentic, you're so interesting. I was like, I don't know if either of them are true, but how do I want to present myself? How do I perceive myself? How do I value myself? That's how I try to combat any of these sort of microaggressions. It's like, you may have a shade or a sense of who I am, but that's who I'm presenting. Like, the people closest to me know who I am, and those are the people who are of value. Looking around. Hey, Rob, why are you? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> No, but we could actually, uh, so I'll ask a question. Uh, you touched a little bit on that there. Uh, when we were talking yesterday, you were talking about sure. how recently the universe has been pushing you <laughs> to be in spaces that, um, you know, you normally wouldn't see yourself in. You want to talk a little bit to that? Yes. Uh, and maybe in part, and, and thank you for asking that, uh, maybe in part, um, you know, you ask the universe for things, I suppose, and... I remember years and years and years ago, I was like, yeah, I'm going to be best podcast in Baltimore. I'm just, just throwing it out there. And then it, it happens, and then there's more sort of exposure to people. Like I said, I'm from East Baltimore. It's like, oh, who are you, bro? Why are you patting me on the back? I don't, I don't know you. And But, you know, having to kind of bring that down and, and recognize that you're in more of these sort of public and these sort of networking things. So yesterday I, I was invited to the... Um, uh, Pratt Library, they had W. Kamal Bell there, so met him briefly, dropped in my car, and I was like, I'm taking your job, bro. And then that just cascaded out. Um, you know, a week before, I um, did this uh, movie screening, this talk that I had minimal preparation for, and I'm a prep guy, I, I gotta prepare. Uh, and we were discussing, me and this uh, author, we were discussing The Room, which if you've seen that movie, is terrible. But also, we were funny. So it just worked. And we did this sort of uh, mystery science theater 3000 kind of talk along. And again, that's another thing that I put out there in the universe that I didn't know it was going to like happen. And um, like literally since October, since like October 8th, I've been asked to do moderating panels, being a part of panels, doing talks like, like this and things of the sort. And it's kind of like taking it to that next that next level of being more out there publicly, and um, you know, not just having a face for radio. I guess. I mean, I mean, Sean Chappie took great pictures of me. I was like, who the hell is that? Is that me? I was like, how did I get so chocolatey? This is great. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's I've been very fortunate to um, have these opportunities and be called upon and um, be part of this uh, larger community, the creative community. I'm out. Oh. Now we got some questions. Here we go. The more I talk, the more questions come. Shower me with your questions. Um, I think you're an amazing uh, inspiration to me. I'm trying to figure out how to uh, find my voice with my love for Baltimore. So, um, you know, all the things. So I'll put the catch up all day. Um, however, I found myself, I manifested things that I want for myself as a representative for Baltimore but I'm having a hard time navigating in these spaces as the youngest person, the only black woman, um, being young and married, being young and childless, but also feeling powerless because the people that are vocalizing about Baltimore are transplants. 
Yeah. And so then I come off as aggressive or defensive when I'm saying that's not true. That's not what happened. Because yeah. I'm so Baltimore, I remember not a funeral home. So I remember Santa Luke being the candy guy in Mont Diamond. So right. you, can't, you can't steal my Baltimore and you can't destroy it. But when I say this isn't true, I'm immediately the villain. Mm-hmm. It's, and thank you. Um, I, I did an interview yesterday in, in Philadelphia, and I was, I asked, uh, this is the director of communications for Mural Arts Philadelphia, and I'd asked him this question. It's one of the first times I've worked it in a conversation. How do we progress while maintaining the culture of a place and, you know, bringing in some of these resources, which naturally lends to transplants and so on, and there's this sort of uh, exchange. And he said it very eloquently and very simply, and I think simplicity is key a lot of times. He's like, don't let it. He's like, make sure that you're at the forefront. Make sure you find a way to get into those meetings. He's like, you gotta be the annoying person. He's like, you might have to have a podcast. I was like, hey, you talking about me? <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's kind of one of those things and um, it's, it's very tough, it's very challenging. I definitely feel that and um, I remember Someone told me uh, when I was like, "Yeah, I do a podcast." Here's my car. He's like, "You don't look like you do a podcast." And I was like, "What the? F what does that mean?" <laughs> and it, it's it's kind of one of those things. And it's I've noticed this is really funny to me. I've noticed an increasing number of people who do not think I'm from Baltimore, and maybe it's because of the sort of growth of the podcast. It's like, oh, we don't really get on. It's like, I'm from Lafayette Projects. Like, what are you saying? Like, I'm from East East Side, we're East. So yeah, I think you know. It, it has to be a priority. It has to be something that um, that leadership is invested in, and you know, you see it. You see different people making investments, and uh, different pieces are being sold off. But I think the true Baltimoreans, and I think in part with this podcast, and I and I'm being I'm being told this, not me saying this as much, is kind of archiving what it's been. And as we see that sort of shift of, oh yeah, I came from Tallahassee, cool. I want to talk to a, I want to talk to a Baltimorean. I like I appreciate you and what you're doing, but if it's between you and a person from like West Baltimore, I'm going to West Baltimore first because I feel like that's the real story. If I'm doing a Baltimore story, I also just I know that question wasn't for me, but uh, I want to and I am a transplant, but I want to uplift this community. I think that the Creative Mornings community is one of the warmest rooms you'll ever be in, and I I would hope that we don't have any gatekeepers here, and that if you know, if you want to talk to somebody, t and I know them, I'll gladly introduce you. And I think that that is something that is resonates with this room. And I think a lot of people in this room also, like, we're all, you know, we're not gatekeepers. We're trying to help each other out. So ask everyone, ask everyone. We have that collaboration board by the door. Put up what you can offer and what you need, and let's help each other out. I saw, yeah, there it is. I think this is like the most questions I've ever been asked. It's weird being on the other side of the interview kind of thing. <laughs> Thank you for your story and your stories. Um, I'm curious as the, maybe you do video as part of your podcast. I, yes. I break cameras all the time. So no, cameras just, all it's <laughs> just, they just shatter. Yeah, I take pictures and I break cameras too. Um, but I'm curious as like video is sort of sweeping every market, you know, the algorithms are like favoring video everywhere. Do you see yourself living in podcast, voice work, radio? Is there tension that you feel to like bring video into what you do to stay relevant, or how would you approach that? I've been I've been looking at doing um, more video. I have a um, I have a project that I'm looking at doing that combines like a, a space like a, a space like this with sort of like the live interview and do it as a series at that space. So. I've done a few interviews at um, Baltimore Museum of Industry, and the goal is to do more, maybe it be with people there, maybe it definitely being something that's filmed. As in addition to it, um, I still like audio. I think it allows you to be a little bit more immersed. Um, and I start looking at, like, what is it, this week, uh, uh, Monkey Paw Productions. Uh, Jordan Peele just released this really cool, uh, um, horror, immersive sort of like radio drama, audio drama, there's no video component to it. So it's it's like a mix. I think there's investments going into it, but there is this push for more video. Um, but it's really, do the people do the people like it? And getting that feedback from folks is really, 
really cool. Like, I have no followers, so the algorithm hates me. I got like five, not even 5,000 followers. It's like Everyone go follow Rob. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we got, oh, we got to wrap up soon now. Y'all got all these questions, but. <laughs> um, with so much, uh, the, the hot button word uh, right now is like misinformation, right? Yeah. Um, can you provide a operational definition of the word truth? Mm. with the hard questions. <laughs> it's a really, really great way to end that. Um, truth is, I think it's aligned with your values. It's aligned with, and I, and I, don't, I don't know what operational truth, I don't, I don't know what it means, but um, what I, I think truth is connected to being empathetic. I think truth is allowing for space for people to say what their values are, what they believe in, and I think with it, it can change. Truth has to be sort of like dynamic. If we had this one sort of, this is the truth, wipe your hands, we're done. That's not how that works. It has to be something that you're able to get new information, process it, and see how it fits for you. I'm speaking in terms of like individual truth and not necessarily the overarching. Like, you know, there'll be, you look at history, there are some people who believe that this religion is the only religion. This is the truth for this. And then you'll have something that disproves it later. So as time progresses, I think we have to be dynamic in how we look at truth and how we perceive truth and how we operate within it. So that's, right. that's how I look at it. April, you got the last question. Um, hi. hi. Uh, I guess I just, um, I didn't know that you were a data collector and that you worked with data, um, which makes everything make so much more sense. <laughs> um, it's the glasses. No. <laughs> but I feel like data is, um, you know, those are like facts. And then the, the, when data is used, it is kind of creating um, a narrative or a truth. Um, and I was just wondering if you could speak to sort of like your thoughts on the connection between like perspective and truth. Uh, and then I had a second question. It seems like you are doing a ton of work um, and I wonder about the sustainability of that. Do you see yourself shifting um, to kind of not have a day job and only be a podcaster? Um, yeah, so. Uh, thank you. Um, I think the, the interviews are almost a version of like data collection, like anecdotal data, what have you. Um, and this comes from some of the feedback I used to get. I worked in a, an AIDS research study for a long time and we're doing certain like measurements. Those are like the hard number sort of things. And then we're taking into account, what did this person say here? So I think it's a mix. I think in sort of the commentary, there's a version of storytelling there. And um, I think that's kind of where I feel about that. I think there, there is a mix. And just from what I've seen and how I've seen it, um, as far as uh, there's a lot of money in podcasting. There's so much. Like the inside of this is made of gold. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Um, I, I think it, it is a lot. It is. Um, I remember I brought a duffel bag with me. I had my recording gear, my gym gear, my laptop for two different, both laptops. And I was like, I am doing too many things. I am a serial killer. What, what am I doing? <laughs> and um, I think really being able to kind of refine how many episodes I'm putting out, maybe trimming that number down to I'm going to do 60, I'm going to do 100, and then that's what I'm doing and kind of record and batch and do it in a sort of busy way, maybe recalibrate. Again, recalibration, like I said earlier about, about truth, I think it's a con constantly recalibrating. I look at the first season, it's 20 episodes. This season is gonna be probably 120. So it's growing in that sort of way, so I need to find out what is the norm, what is the, the true number I really wanna work with. And uh, that, that data job pays a lot of money. I think um, what I want to just like uplift to like what I think April was alluding to too is that like uh, you're you're a treasure here and we don't want you to burn out so <laughs> let's uh, make sure that we remember to do some self care some rest um, but y'all can you help me thank Rob yeah Wave Daddy yeah right. let's hear it for Wave Daddy <laughs> thank you.